My name is Robert Clapper, and for the last, in addition to what they said, for the last seven years I've been developing online education tools and online education courses. And for the last four years, trying to build artificial intelli artificially intelligent applications to put in those courses, because those courses tend to, I don't want to say be boring, but they're, they have ended up being a little bit boring. So what I want to talk to you about, I'm going to talk first about where I see online education and where it stands today. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by artificial education, so give you a, sort of a little primer on, on how we use it. And finally, talk about some, some of the applications that we are putting in place and, and trying to improve the way we teach and learn. I was thinking about how could I explain how the state of online education today, and I was thinking, imagine a milkman back in 1915, and he's got his horse and his wagon, and he delivers the milk every morning at 5 a.m., going around town, dropping it off door to door. And one day, he's taking his, going on his route, and, pat, and what passes him is the first flatbed truck. And he takes a look at this truck, and he goes, you know what, this actually could improve my business. I could maybe go a little further. I could extend out. I could do more. I could get more customers. So he goes out the next day, and he looks around, and he finds a flatbed truck for sale, buys it, brings it home, puts it, on, puts it in the backyard. Next morning, he gets up 4 a.m., loads up the wagon, hitches up the horse, leads the horse and wagon up on the back of the flatbed and drives it around, does his route. And that's kind of where online, online education is right now. We're taking things that we've been doing for a thousand years and putting them onto the web as, rather than trying to look for new ways to try and use that medium. So I have MOOCed up here as, as a slide. One thing we do is we take a lecture like this, whether it's a professor standing talking to 500 students, we film it, we put it online, we call it a massively open online course, and we do a wonderful thing in that we extend the breadth of, of that lecture. Um, the other things we do in online education now is we take the discussion board, we give out a discussion, and if there's students in the audience, you know how much you love this. We give you a discussion question, you answer it, you go back and you read other students' questions a couple of days later, you look to see if anyone responded to your questions. Essentially a long letter writing campaign, back and forth, trying to, to, to flesh out new ideas. And these are all very valid things to do with online education, but there's so much more that's there that we can do. And we want to be able to try and improve the way we teach and learn. We want to try and be able to take the power of the technology that's there and move beyond just simply putting a lecture online, putting PowerPoint slides online, putting discussion boards, basically taking the text we used to give out in PDFs and slapping them on a web page in a learning management system and calling it online education. And online education is, is growing more and more important. It's the lifelong learning vehicle that we have, and we need to figure out ways that we can improve it that way. So, to give you a very brief rundown of what I mean by artificial intelligence and, and when I say the word AI, there are two ways, there are two basic camps of artificial intelligence. One is called strong AI, and it's probably the one we've, we hear about more um, when we read the paper and when we watch television shows like Westworld and everything else. But this, this is the AI where uh, people like Ray Kurzweil are studying it, saying at some point, machines are going to be smarter than us. At some point, there's going to be a time when uh, a, a computer software program and a machine that's learned is going to be more intelligent than a human being and able to do everything a human being can do. That's not the AI that I'm interested in. I'm interested in what's known as weak AI, which is a terrible name, actually, I think, because it's really not weak at all. It's the AI that goes by other names, such as machine learning, but it's the ability to teach software programs to teach themselves and to, to be able to gain knowledge. But most of the, the knowledge that gets put into these systems is not general intelligence like strong AI wants to put together. It's programmed intelligence. So it's intelligence that everybody's gone online and dealt with a, a customer service bot. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer most of the time and you, somebody has programmed in all that intelligence into it. So there's a tremendous opportunity for us to take that kind of, of AI and change it into a way that we can improve the way we teach and learn. That way to take artificial intelligence in the weak sense, in the machine learning sense, and develop applications that open up many, many new uh, vistas and new ways of trying to teach using the online medium. Also, what I need to talk about before we go into the actual applications of it. 
are how humans and AIs go together. Human, and, human beings and artificial intelligence work together. There are going to be many th- uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, especially agent-based artificial intelligence, where um, the software takes in uh, uh, feedback from the world and be, is able to execute things, which, for example, is the self-driving car, the self-driving truck, um, the people that used to answer customer service calls that are now replaced by bots. There are many um, uh, situations where the human beings, human beings are being replaced by AI. But what I'm most fascinated by are the AI applications that actually take what a human being does and improve it. So, for example, doctors, um, there are AI applications out there that uh, are able to read millions of medical research journals when the, and when symptoms of a patient are programmed in, can provide um, a very detailed suggestion of diagnoses. Now, the human being, the doctor, is the one who knows the context and is able to look at whether or not certain diagnoses are going to fit. But what that AI program does not replace the doctor, it makes the doctor much better. And the same thing goes for lawyers. Lawyers have, uh, you know, you sit in libraries and look through books, case books. There are AI programs now that are able to search millions of cases at one time, come up with connections, draw parallels, everything else to make that lawyer better. But the AI can't get into the courtroom and actually argue a case. And the AI can actually look at the context of a situation and make decisions that way. So I'm looking for artificial intelligence and teachers. I think of it the same way. I think of it, I'm a teacher. I'm not in the business of trying to put myself out of business. I want to try and figure out a way that I can improve what I do so that I'm giving a better experience to the students. And we've been working on a number of different ways to try and get that done. I want to talk about the first way that artificial intelligence is entering education. And there are many um, companies and groups that are, that are putting this kind of uh, software together, and that's called adaptive education. So there's a Russian philosopher, educational philosopher, uh, Lev Vygotsky, who came up with the idea that when we learn something, every person can learn on their own by reading, by listening to lectures, by watching talks. They can learn to a certain point, but at a certain point, there's a zone where they need a human being to intervene. They need a human being to step in and teach them. So every student has a different, what he called the zone of proximal development, a fancy word for just saying, at some point, we need a teacher to help us learn something. And the first applications of AI in education are geared to that. Because online education provides a way that we could potentially be able to teach students at all different levels of development. So, for example, another analogy. You're in the library and you're studying Plato. You're studying Plato's theory of forms, and it doesn't really matter whether you remember or know what Plato's theory of forms is right now. But you're reading your book, and beside you, your school has given you a personal assistant. And that personal assistant is watching you and watching you write your notes, maybe watching you take a quiz, sees you make a wrong answer, sees you make another wrong answer, jumps up, runs down the hallways, grabs the book, the best book he can find on, on Plato and forms, brings it back to you, opens it up to the right page, and says, here's where you were going wrong. So that's what adaptive AI does, is it watches students do tests, do quizzes, uh, fill in even discussion boards in some sense, and tries to provide the information that they're struggling with. So a way to try and have uh, a situation where students are getting taught what they need to be taught at the right time. So it's about time. So it's really a very intelligent search engine that, that does that. But what the AI can't do is it can't see the furrowed brow of the student. It can't see the sweat coming down the face about to drip on the table. It can't see the the nerves. It can't see the way that they're writing that is is demonstrating angst and everything else. And that's what the teacher still does. So what we've tried to do is develop uh, artificial intelligence applications that take advantage of both those things. So how can we develop something that provides a situation where what they're being taught actually comes in at the right time, but at the same time providing a way for a teacher to mentor at at the right time. So beyond just saying, okay, you got this particular question wrong, so you need this information, we're there to actually step in and actually do the teaching and be able to teach that way. So that's the first half of what we're doing in AI. The second half of what we're doing is building experiential platforms. Because one thing artificial intelligence can do, especially in natural language processing, which is really just computers being able to listen to language, whether it's text or whether it's spoken, and be able to to pull out the meaning of what's being said. So everyone's probably talked to Siri or seen someone talk to Siri or watched movies of people talking to Siri, whichever. 
And lots of people have done the, the customer support or worked with bots and actually asked it questions and it figures it out. The AI is really determining what it is that the person's saying. So saying, I understand that you are asking about X. You're asking about, uh, you know, you, you can't load the software or whatever it happens to be. So the other half of that are the answers being programmed in. So what we've done, we, we want to try and take the power of that and create an experiential platform for the students. And the only way I can kind of explain that is to go into examples, to go into how it, how it actually works and give you something specific. So we've created what we call simulations for teaching. And one place we've uh, taken the simulation and executed it is in teaching communication. So it's, you know, we're sort of teaching communication with communication. But professional communication is one of the hardest things to actually learn. And everyone that's taken that introductory three-month writing course, um, at the end of it, you know, understands a bit of the theory. But to actually be able to go out into the real world and execute it is difficult. So what we did was create a platform where students, instead of going to a course, a traditional online course with modules week one to week 10, they join a fictitious consulting company as a junior associate. And they're on a 12-week training program, and they're going to be working on projects. And they're going to be working with clients, and they're going to be working with vendors, and working with peers, and with other stakeholders, with um, different people within the consulting company. And all of these characters are artificial intelligent characters. So what we do is create a little, little base of knowledge for a little fake person. So we have a client who, to give you one of the narratives that, that we use in the, in the simulations, uh, the student is tasked with finding a new website design firm for a client. So they're given a client, they're given some vendors that they need to talk to, and they need to do analysis, they need to um, do some research, they need to persuade they need to um, tell bad news when they tell the clients that don't get it. So they're practicing all the theories that they're taught in the course. So these little characters we've created, the character of a client, he knows everything about what that particular company that he, his fictitious company, needs in a website design firm. So we program that in. So that character is extremely intelligent if you ask it anything about what it needs from, from a website design firm. Ask it anything else and there's no clue. The vendors, same thing. They know everything about what they can offer and everything that they can do. And the student can communicate with them. So they can send messages to the client. What do you need? What can I do for you? How can I, how can I find a website design firm for you? They can go to the vendors. What's your specialty? What things do you do, you, uh, do for, for clients? Put the two together, write a persuasive message, and really experience what it's like to actually do the communication. Because the, the characters will... Uh, question the student if the argument is not strong. The, the, the characters will question the student if the analysis is not complete. Um, the character gets upset if they're told bad news in a terrible way. So the student actually gets a little bit of uh, a sense of what it's like out there. To give you an example of what that's like, uh, in the engineering simulation we have, one of the uh, uh, scenarios has them doing an incident report where there's been a, a terrible thing happen at a company, a disaster, a huge software crash, chemical leak, that sort of thing. And the student is tasked with talking to two characters within the simulation and trying to figure out what they do, what happened, and what they, part they had in, in the accident, and, and to give their take on it. Which on the surface is pretty good, pretty easy. It's a good exercise in trying to get, get information and question it. And we've programmed the characters to not really want to talk about it. So the first time they actually ask about it, they're, dealt, they're given a, a response that's sort of vague and, you know, don't bother me kind of response. And the students have to learn how to, to dig deeper and get them to open up. But the real interesting challenge is one of the characters says to the student about halfway into that task, you know, there's this information and this information and I'd really like you to take it out. Can you just take it out? It, it's, it, to be honest, it doesn't make me look that good. And in my opinion, it's not that important. And you should just take it out. Now, we did that, and a large number of the engineering students just took it out and removed it, not realizing this is a pretty severe ethical challenge. And this is where I can show you where the teacher comes in, because I've been talking all now about the artificial intelligence, where does the teacher actually come in? This is where the teacher can mentor, because the teacher plays a role of the boss. You know, they're in a training program, as I said before, so the boss is looking at all their communications, and when the instructor as a senior director sees the student actually 
taking that information out, actually doing, being unethical, because on an ethical level, they should be providing all the information that they're given, and not, it's not up their decision to take information out because, just because they get asked. But this, the instructor gets to step in and message the students separately about what they did and explain that ethical challenge, and the students are blown away because it's the first time they actually experience ethics for real in a risk-free environment. If this had happened in the job, it's no longer so risk-free. So they get a chance to actually be able to um, make mistakes, do things incorrectly, and the same mentoring goes on if the, if the writing is not up to par, um, if their analysis is weak, if they're not persuasive, the instructor can step in and mentor. And what happens is the student on the online course, and I know probably a lot of you have done the on, taken online courses, and probably know how much you actually interact with the instructor in an online course beyond the, the check marks and discussion boards and things, actually feels like they're getting taught. And they're getting taught at the time when they need to be taught. So they're actually being mentored at a time. But the teacher couldn't do that if they had to provide the level of feedback that's provided by the clients and by the vendors and by the characters in the simulation. So all the, the main feedback, student makes an argument, it's not a very good argument. The character answers appropriately. I don't understand, whichever. The student has to do it again. So that kind of feedback is impossible. Being a teacher, I know what that's like trying to actually get that accomplished. It's next to impossible if you have 50 students. In this case, you get that level of it. But it, the artificially intelligent characters are the ones that provide that feedback. It's almost as if the instructor is a director of a play, and they have all these characters, a whole bunch of them are purely algorithms and numbers, and a few are human beings and the students, and they orchestrate it and make it go back and forth. And the, the feedback that the, the mentoring, is, the, the feedback that the teacher can provide in the way of mentoring makes the student feel like it's just them, and that it's at their, their exact time of needing to be taught that they get taught. And this is where I see the power of AI in education. It's not about trying to remove the teacher from the equation, it's, and it can't because it doesn't work without it. Um, but it's a way of trying to take and, and expand the horizon, expand the area that, that online education can deal in. So we'll get away from just purely replacing things and adding a whole new plane of, of space that we can actually educate students in and putting them into situations that are real. And this would work for all sorts of anything that's communication-based. We talked about Plato earlier. You could create a Plato character, virtual character that you could have a dialectic with and talk to. And these simulations are done by experts, so it's almost as if they're writing a book. And in my opinion, the next step in educational material will be from a paper textbook to something like this, where you're actually immersed in it and you're embedded in it. Because the expertise that goes into creating these simulations is akin to writing a textbook and writing a real book. So anyway, to conclude, when I say online education, everybody goes, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to take that. I don't want to fill out one more discussion post. That you get a sense that online education is evolving. It's growing. There's things being done that are exciting and going to make it so that lifelong learning is going to be something that we all want to do. Thank you very much.